Welcome to The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. We're here every week with another show that deals with topical issues and sometimes legal issues, but today just a very interesting guest. Indeed, we call this show the reunion with Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon because she's been on the show a number of times and we just thought it was a good time to ask her back, kind of find out what's going on in the Lieutenant Governor's office in the state generally and some of the issues that uh, she's dealing with and, and trying to uh, assist Oklahoma on. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, this is, we're approaching a very active political season. We're hearing a lot, uh, we're just finishing a tourism season, and we're going to hear a lot about both tourism and, uh, and politics and uh, what the session's going to do. Uh, any thoughts she has about what's going to happen in the future? We think uh, she's always an interesting, fun guest, and we're pleased she'd give us this time. She is a Lieutenant Governor, Mary Fallon, joining us on The Verdict when we get back. For one Oklahoma-based company, success didn't happen overnight. Initially, the days were long, 80-hour weeks common. As we grew, we wanted to share our success, and the ideals of corporate and civic responsibility found a welcome home. Today, we're the largest investor in the Sooner State, and a source for exciting, new, high-quality jobs. We're Chesapeake Energy, committed to building a better Oklahoma. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. We're very pleased to welcome back the Honorable Mary Fallon, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma, to join us on The Verdict and to visit with uh, Mick and me. Uh, Governor Fallon is an Oklahoma State University graduate. She served both in the uh, Oklahoma House of Representatives and uh, thereafter was elected uh, as the first woman and first Republican uh, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma and still is the first uh, holding both uh, such uh, distinctions. Uh, she has had a strong focus while she's been Lieutenant Governor on ed economic development, education, children's issues and health care and not to leave out government reform. Uh, she is uh, making her third uh, trip to the verdict and we thank her very much for giving us uh, her valuable time. Thank you, Governor, for being here. It's always good to be with you. I, I enjoy watching your show. Thank you. It's good to see you, too. Great job. Now, tell us about the RAMP initiative. Well, it's good to see you, Mayor. The RAMP initiative is a plan to bring together people from across Oklahoma. In fact, I have about 15 people in all different business professions, some that have been former government employees, but mainly from the business world, to look at our state parks and our state resorts. We are very blessed in Oklahoma to have an abundance of land, abundance of water, natural resources, and of course tourism and our outdoor life enhances the quality of life for Oklahoma. We have great museums, music festivals, places to go, and it's very important to economic development. But we also have a lot of needs in our state park systems. And so I put together a group called RAMP, Reevaluation, Assessment, and Management Plan for our state parks and our state resorts brought together these individuals, and it's individuals like Ben Sorza, who owns eateries, a very astute businessman, Jimmy Houston, who's a wonderful fisherman, if you've ever seen the Jimmy Houston show, and he's very colorful to, to be around too, Jane Giroux, who is a former head of the Department of Tourism, also a former Miss America, outstanding community leader, and Bob Slater, who lives in Oklahoma City, he was the national president of the American Motel Hotel Association, so he knows an awful lot about motels and hotels, which we have the resorts, and those are just a few people. I've got a lot of other just businessmen and women from all across the state that are on the commission. We met uh, last week. We're going to be meeting again every month, 
and visiting some of our state parks and resorts and to basically look at them and see what the capital needs are, see what the image is to determine where we want to be in the future and how we can preserve and take care even our ecosystems in our state. Now sometimes you hear people say we ought to privatize our state parks. Any, any efforts in that direction? Well I think the efforts are more in, in the um, looking at our state resorts. There's a difference between parks mm -hmm. and a lodge and I think a lot of people get those two things mixed up. We have 50 state parks in the state of Oklahoma and we have four main lodges in our state and then we have two resort I should say four main resorts and then two lodges that are not full-blown um, uh, resorts in themselves. And they were built in the 1950s. Um, we needed them back in the 1950s. There, were, there was little private sector investment into recreational ac activities, but now, of course, you have all kinds of opportunities for recreation in the state. Since that time, obviously if, after a 50-year time period, the lodges have many capital improvement needs they have uh, different marketing needs and with priorities at the capital being you know prisons right now roads and highways education medicaid funding for the poor and the elderly those types of things tourism typically falls kind of at the bottom when it comes to funding even though it's our third largest industry in our state and of course it's a quality of life issue so my goal is to bring people in from the outside to look at where we've been, what we're doing, where we need to be going, and to develop a strategic plan, a national model for our state parks and also for the resorts. Now back to your privatization question, I've been uh, advocating for many, many years that we bring the private sector into partner with us to help government to build up a first class resort system uh, that we could enjoy, but yet with their money. <laughs> no more taxpayer money, but, but their money if, if we can. And so the good news is the legislature passed a piece of legislation a couple of years ago that would allow us to look at Lake Texoma, which is down the southern border of Oklahoma. A lot of Texans love Lake Texoma. It's a great place to go, but the lodge is 50 years old. And then we have two, these two golf courses down there in state parks and cabins. Great place to go, a marina, but the lodge is really old and, and outdated. So anyway, to make a long story short, we have actually um, invited national consultants in the hotel motel business and national, national investors with money to come in and put in a bid um, through the bid process to develop a plan to build up tourism and to build a first class resort, manage the golf courses and even to do some private development and bring in capital and jobs and money into that area. The bids will be back in on November 2nd and we will see uh, what the plans are from the private sector and hopefully those will be finalized around December and who knows we could even possibly have new management of Lake Texoma by February hmm. and a great investment in southern Oklahoma. Well the tourism department recently got some accolades for uh, uh, the way it's been promoting tourism in Oklahoma nationally did it not? You bet we did. What, and, what was that? And I want to give credit to Ackerman McQueen, Angus McQueen and his staff, Barbara Johnson have just done a tremendous job of developing a plan to market and advertise and, and themes and images uh, Native America, Native Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Cool, Oklahoma Soul, if you've seen any of the commercials that have been on TV that run in our state but also in other states but they won a national award as having one of the best marketing campaigns in the nation so we're very proud of them and they just won uh, another year to sell Oklahoma and to market Oklahoma as our advertising agent. I know one of your, changing the subject now, I know one of your constitutional duties is to from time to time uh, preside over the state senate. Uh, that gets a lot of publicity when it happens. Uh, tell our viewers about what those duties are as you understand them and when you uh, do indeed preside over the senate. What brings that about? Well the constitution provides that the lieutenant governor is the president of the senate and has the ability to preside over joint sessions between the House and Senate and also to break a tie vote if there's ever a tie in a vote on legislation in the state Senate. But the Senate, Senate members, the senators themselves over the years have created rules and within their caucus rules in the Senate they have provided that the pro temp of the Senate will daily run the business of the state Senate. But the president's over the pro temp of the state Senate. So anyway on a couple occasions when we've had some very controversial ideas issues and ideas I should say 
come before. I've gone into the Senate to help when there might be a tie-breaking vote or to even help break what I call the logjam of, of ideas in the Senate. I did that uh, back in the year 2000 on the issue of right to work. I was asked by uh, the Republican caucus to come in and see if we could move them along on just letting the issue be debated on the floor. Sometimes we have issues that we want to advocate for our state, but they can't even get a hearing mm -hmm. in the Senate. And so I went in, and in that year, we had a three-day standoff on the issue of right to work. We did have a vote, went down by one vote. But the next year, they came back and authored right to work in the Senate, passed, went to the House, passed out of the House, went to the governor. Governor Keating signed it, sent it to the other people, and the, vote, and the people of Oklahoma voted and said, yes, we want right to work. And that's one of the ways you can get things done. Let me jump in here and show you your website as we go to our first commercial break. I know we're going to have a lot more to talk about, but if people want to uh, send an email or find out more information about the Lieutenant Governor's office, they can go on the web and go to that website that's right there. We'll be back with Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon right after this. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. American Express Tax and Business Services. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. American Express Tax and Business Services. In Oklahoma City, the phone number is 405-843-5311. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers and today's guest, the Lieutenant Governor, Mary Fallon. Uh, Governor, the last time you were here, I guess it's been a little over a year ago, um, it was uh, fairly, uh, I guess maybe it's been longer ago than that because it seems like it was uh, fairly recent after the election and Governor Henry had been elected governor and we were discussing how that would work with a lieutenant governor from one party and a governor from another party and we were trying to, to predict how that relationship would happen and we hope for the best and, and what can you report back what's been your viewpoint of, of that relationship well i've had the opportunity to serve under two governors now under governor keating for eight years under this governor for almost three years and there is a, a difference between the two um, i will say that with governor keating i was in his cabinet i attended regular monthly cabinet meetings with him and his various cabinet secretaries we traveled out to various communities to meet with people and to listen to ideas and share policy initiatives that were going on around the state and we frequently attended events together whether it was uh, a new company coming into town or maybe some dinner at the mansion or you know, entertainment of some executives of sorts um, of course by nature when you have people of two different political parties there's going to be some division there my hope has always been that being that he's a, a Democrat and I'm a Republican, that we could work together because we both represent the same people. We're both elected statewide. We both have the same um, groups of people that we're, we have to listen to, we want to listen to, and we represent. But there has been a difference, I will, I will tell you that, between the two in that I think um, when, when you're of different political parties, sometimes a governor feels a little threatened by someone that's right behind them. And I think we've seen a little bit of that. I've always tried to invite him to different things that I do as far as um, some of my major initiatives. Like I was on here one time talking about an aerospace summit that we have and then we also have a, a hunt in which we invite CEOs from across the country to hunt turkeys and I've invited him to, to those types of things or even Small Business Day at the Capitol which I've done every year. I've tried to include him in on that and sometimes he'll, he'll come, sometimes he hasn't been able to but 
it's always better, in my opinion, when two people can meet on the common issues that we believe in and then just agree to disagree on the issues that we feel are important to the state that we will stand up and battle for. Let me uh, kind of ask you to look ahead at the 2006 uh, session of the legislature. Uh, what do you see are the, as being the major issues that will have to be addressed by the legislature in 2006? Well, 2006 is going to be a very interesting year. 2004 was the first time that term limits set in mm -hmm. And we saw a huge changeover in the legislature. A lot of people left that year because of term limits. We saw a changeover in the leadership of the House of Representatives where it went from Democrat to Republican. Basically the first time since 1920 that we'd had Republican control. The Senate actually changed over two seats and became a little closer in parity between Republicans and Democrats, which caused a lot of things to actually be looked at in the state Senate that might not have been discussed before. But 2006 is going to be the time in election cycle wise to where the seats that were taken over in the House will either have to be held or could possibly have some changeover. And there's a prediction that the Senate may even change over from Democrat control to Republican control. Right now in the Senate you have 26 Democrats, 22 Republicans, and if the Republicans just picked up two more seats you'd have a 22-22 which puts the President of the Senate as a tie breaking vote. So that could change the whole political structure out at the state capitol. As far as issues go, it's going to be an election year. People will be campaigning. You may see a little bit of, I don't know, people less willing to take chances on issues. I think we'll be discussing corrections. We've been talking about a special session this summer. You've seen the House Republicans come out and say, we don't believe we need a special session. Just spend the money. you got the money in your budget right now. Hire the correction workers. We'll come back in the first year give you a supplemental that's the fastest way to do things. Uh, we, we have the money there, let's just get it behind us. We'll take care of you and once session gets in. So that will probably still be an issue that we'll discuss. Centennial funding, we're coming up on our 2007th, 100th birthday, mm -hmm. year 2007. Great things are gonna be happening across the state, but we need to look at some centennial funding issues. We're gonna be seeing uh, issues like the estate tax, the death tax, we saw a plan put forth a week ago to go ahead and further eliminate the estate tax. Probably see some more tax reform being discussed at the state capitol. You always have uh, workers comp, tort reform, business issues, education, those will always be issues that will be discussed mm -hmm. during session. Let me, let me ask you just about, just very briefly, we took some major strides in workers comp this last year. Did we do enough or is there more needed to be done? Well, you might remember I got in a little tiff again <laughs> in the Oklahoma <laughs> Senate. There was a wonderful bill that passed out of the House that had been worked on very diligently by many, many people for a long period of time to really overhaul the workers' compensation system to make it more cost effective for our business community, but yet take care of the injured worker to eliminate some of the fraud in the system to eliminate some of the time delays that are in the system and also to look at some of the benefits going back to the injured workers and their families. The bill passed out of the House of Representatives, got over to the Senate, and the Senate wouldn't let it come to the Senate floor. And so we had a standoff in the Senate, we kept waiting and waiting for it to be heard, wouldn't be heard. So finally I was asked by the Senators to come in and try to push along the workers' comp bill, get it on the Senate floor so it can just be heard and be debated on. You either vote against it or vote for it, either way. But just let the discussion be in the open air in the light of the day. Well, of course, the senators didn't want to do that, those who aren't really for workers' compensation reform. So we had another little standoff and walk off, and they walked off for three days, even turned off my microphone, sent the staff home, didn't even you know, record it in the journals half the time, and just the games that are played at the state capitol. We finally <laughs> had a little tiff about, do, does the lieutenant governor, does do the lieutenant governor, I gotta say this right, does the lieutenant governor have the right to come in and take over and preside over the Senate? So they were gonna challenge the Constitution on that. I went ahead and called some legal experts in on constitutionality. They drafted a legal brief and we were just gonna go to the Supreme Court and let it be settled on if I have the right to do that. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, the next day, the people who thought I might not have uh, the right to do that decided, well, maybe we can just go ahead and have session anyway. And so I didn't file the legal brief in the Supreme Court, but I have it ready if I ever need it. And we did have a session that next day. The workers' compensation bill did fail by a, a small uh, margin on the vote, party line vote basically. But 
out of that, we said we don't want reform unless it's really true, workers' compensation reform. We didn't pass anything by the end of session, but we did come back in a special session and passed uh, a workers' compensation bill. Did it do everything we wanted it to do? No, it never does. But we did get some workers' compensation reform through, and I believe if we hadn't raised a little bit of a stink in the state senate, we may not have had even the extent that we had in the special session for reform. Just about 10 or 15 seconds left in the show. It has gone so quickly. A lot of people were urging you to run for governor. You've decided not to run. Anything else you'd like to say about the governor's race in general? Well, it's always a, a challenge to take on an incumbent governor. I did look very seriously at it. I also know that my role in the state Senate could become even more important if we get to the point that a couple more seats are picked up by the Republicans in the Senate and I need to be that tie-breaking vote to push things along. And so uh, there's always a tomorrow, there's always a future races that one can look at, but for right now I'm going to run for re-election for lieutenant governor and continue on working on the issues I'm working on. Thank you very much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank okay. you, Governor. Kent and I'll be back with a final word after this. That land next door was a mess. Take more than a lawnmower to revive that land. I heard the oil and natural gas people was cleaning up old oil sites. And it wouldn't cost us a flood nickel. Oh, yes, sir, it was quite a revival. The whole church showed up, want to make a playground for the kids. <laughs> it sure is a blessing. <laughs> Bringing out the best in each student, that is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities, parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. back on the verdict another interesting show with the lieutenant governor Mary Fallon yes yeah, she just does a fine job on our show explaining uh, what's going on out the Capitol and what she does as uh, lieutenant governor she's been doing that job a little while now and uh, and uh, carries out her duties uh, in a constitutional manner and one that uh, is always interesting and uh, sometimes controversial uh, the governor's race uh, was, of course, talked about uh, uh, for a while and uh, who might run against the, the incumbent Brad Henry, and her name came up over and over again, but she uh, voluntarily took herself out of that race pretty early on. It opened the field for others. Uh, J.C. Watts has now taken his name out. It now remains to be seen who might jump in, and uh, I will tell our viewers we plan to have a, a show about that uh, coming up uh, with Mike McCarville in uh, two or three weeks and uh, by that time the dust probably will have settled a little bit and we'll have a little better idea about that. Uh, the show we're going to offer uh, up to our viewers for information next week is on electricity and we have named it why uh, when you flip the switch the light comes on or it doesn't. Uh, we're going to have the Honorable Denise Bode, Oklahoma Corporation Commissioner and Max Spiegel, uh, General Counsel of the Oklahoma uh, Metropolitan Power Authority on to talk about uh, why electricity uh, is, uh, how it gets generated, how it gets delivered, and uh, how it gets to our homes and, and normally is there when you flip the switch. We've been giving out the Lieutenant Governor's uh, e uh, web address uh, throughout the show. Let me also give you the Verdict's web address. If you have an idea for an upcoming edition you'd like to see on the Verdict, send us a line at theverdict.tv. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next time on the Verdict.